It's an overpromised and unrealistic time frames uh, of production from certain companies, uh, next gens, visions. Do you agree on that? Yes, I do. I I I I, I absolutely agree that you cannot you cannot sort of decide tomorrow from a, a wait and a wait and see to say then I'm going to be producing uh, by 2029. Impossible. And welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucy, and some of you know me as Triangle Investor from social medias. I'm delighted to have DPL of CEO, Mr. John Barshoff, back to my show. John, it has been a while, one year to be exact, uh, since we last talked. So welcome back, sir. Thank you. Good to be back. And uh, at least with one year differences, there should be some information and more, more news to to talk about uh, in terms of from my perspective. Yeah, definitely. The uranium price actually was around $50 when you were in my show in late July, I believe that was. So yes. and then you said, and I quote you, I am not getting out of that below $65 yes. back then. Yes. Yes. And yes. let the young guys give their contracts. The, I'm quoting you. Uh, you were definitely right uh, on that, uh, John. So my first question is, uh, is John Borshov out of the bed now or is he st still sleeping? Well, I've, 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 I've tried to look at the, the whole situation as, as I see it from a, uh, from a, at the high level, which I think that's what counts, you sometimes get caught up in the detail and it's not that relevant. Uh, um, and, and when I look at it, I just think, you know, in simple terms, there's a big picture that utilities just don't get. And, and, the, and, and we're talking $54 at, at September of last year, which was the WNA time. Um, of, of the market report, and the and when you look at demand, absolutely booming. When you look at China maintaining that strong projection, growth projection, not wavering. The EU, apart from the Germans and Austrians, overwhelming support with real commitments, you know, the Swedes, the, the, the Finns, and just generally, and now a bit of a swing even with the, with the Italians, and, and it's, all, it's all eroding onto, you know, we need sustainable power. The major turnaround in Southeast Asia, as I said before, North America, that awakening giant, which is not yet implicated on top of the issues. Middle East, which are pursuing nuclear with intent, and then the data centres and requires additional immediate nuclear and, uh, and all of those spare capacities you'll find will be grabbed by the hyperscalers. So that demand. And you look at the supply and it's in absolute doldrums. It is uh, the supply sector has been in decline for 12 years to 15, over a decade. And it's now unprepared and highly un undercapitalized to perform against the other side, which is the nuclear demand. Talent drain across the sector is going to create uh, difficulties. Kazad and Prom is in trouble, whether you look at it corporate or technical. I think Cameco is unprepared for serious greenfield uh, growth. They're more an operating company in mentality. And so to get that, that, that good company shifted is going to take a, an effort. The mothball uh, operations that are coming into production are only replacing the diminishing underfeed material and we're now only replicating the production of mine uranium back in 2012. So there's no new uranium coming in. It's just rebalancing the 30, 40 million of underfeed is coming off 
as the 30 to 40 million, if you include MacArthur, coming in and just getting back to status quo. So, and future production is totally dependent on Greenfield, not mothball projects. These are just holding the holding what we already know. And there are few shovel-ready projects of significance available. The the uh, um, and the and the sort of uh, the teams, the commitment of 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 people to really go ahead. So you ask me my 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 question on on price. If you look at such a unbelievable mismatch between supply and demand, uranium price must increase dramatically to get start getting this balance uh, together. So saying the $65 was where I, I would say uh, protecting for the shareholder my reserves and to get best value from those reserves, yes, in producing a product and also uh, um, uh, uh, rewarding shareholders. Now, with, with, the, with the market-related contracts, floors and ceilings, which is, I think, a real truism, sitting between 80, 85 floors, 130 ceilings, the $65 is, is out of the question. I believe even, even now with this, this helicopter view I've given you here that the, the, the current pricing has to improve. And you even saw, you know, listen to what Bannerman said, which I, which I admire. They said that they're delaying their fit because they don't believe the prices are sh where they should be. These are good signs. You know, this is where the, uh, and, and I'm saying that I'm not going to be rushing to get a contract where after all this work that we've done, after all this positioning, and for me to damage that with impatience, where we seriously believe that there will be a breakout, whether that breakout is in three months or six months, it's going to be a breakout. And, um, and when you see these data centres starting up the Three Mile Islands and the Palisades and the Duane, whatever they call Arnolds and all of these, and, and when you see that and probably bringing inventory requirements sooner than later on, on projects that were unplanned by the utilities means you say, oh, the three to four million pounds are already short and it doesn't take much, and these guys have got to bloody all get it because Three Mile Island will probably go into production by 27, 26. Um, they need fuel. And and they this is this is a real consequence. These are uh, are balanced machines, these utilities, and they've been, you know, robbing, robbing, uh, getting cheap uh, Russian material, trying to sneak it through China now, which is going to be stopped. And they got to now say, we got to pay to get security of supply. So I think the price is still to incentivize. It's not there uh, yet. And it's got to be to the dynamic of a demand that you see today, which was different than it was three months ago, six months ago, and 12 months ago. I understand that part that you are not signing anything until the price recovers more and the utilities come to you. But have utilities started to knocking or, uh, to knock on your door? And are utilities actually becoming more conserved as we all expect, uh, or they are still playing the waiting game? I think the utilities are now, you know, uh, some of them are recognising that need and hiding under the shadow of their short-term comfort in supply, but not realising that two years or three years is nothing. There will be breakouts where some utilities will start coming in and to say, look, I believe this, this shortage. I mean, I don't know what fool cannot believe that there will be a supply shortage. It's not just the companies there that are, uh, that are really believable to say, look, these guys are going to come in. 
uh, and and I'm excluding the US because it's a, a small sort of part of the of the bigger supply equation. So some of those do know, and uh, some you know whether there's a problem of, of a breakout to sort of say somebody to capture a uh, um, uh, 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 product and then they they feel like they're letting the team down or the utility group or whatever. I'm not saying there's collusion, but whatever it is that this is unsustainable. There are some recognising, there are people that say, oh, yeah, no, we, yeah, we got to support the industry. They destroyed the industry. They bloody well took every pound at the lowest cost they could get and the product that they've got now to get more product is what they have to uh, contend with and to say, you know, we've got to give uh, enough money per pound for the industry to capitalise, to grow, to reward its shareholders, and no more, no more sort of subsidised uh, 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 products. You made a good point about uh, production not coming, and actually production delays in every sense, uh, in every sense, uh, regulatory, political, related, financial, operational, and one other thing that you didn't mention and i believe is, it's a factor uh is over promised and unrealistic time frames uh, of production from certain companies uh, next gens visions do you agree on that yes i do I I, I I i absolutely agree that you cannot you cannot sort of decide tomorrow from a, a wait and a wait and see to say then I'm going to be producing uh, by 2029, impossible. And um, and the and and the whole the whole uh, issue is is um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, people in the utility side should start listening to what is real, and not listening to what is a a uh, 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 an entrepreneurial sort of show that you know this is what i'm going to produce when there could be five ten years difference in those in those time frames and um so i yes i i agree um um the 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 performance the getting into production uh you can even see now some of the uh, startups are sort of having you know people are reconfiguring what guidance is what it could be when, when everybody was forced in those bad era, uh, periods, forced to make the pot sweeter and sweeter by overstretching, overstretching, and and to keep some sort of interest in the stock, and then you end up with a with an absolute bloody hot potato of how now do you do you actually uh, you know uh, uh, sort of validate what you can produce against what uh, uh, you may, you maybe your market cap is, and these are bloody serious issues. The the and and when when you're sort of you know I mean some of these companies may be pricing at one hundred and forty dollars today, in terms of if you match market cap, just drop drop guidance a little bit. You think hell, this is where the price has to be. Uh, all of these are pressure, right or wrong, on what is sustainable in the supply sector, and. Um, and then you've got, of course, you've got the spuds and the yellow cakes. Now, yellow cake is outside of the market. It just deals with, with what it gets from uh, Kazakhstan. But if, uh, if spud is to, be, to feed that big requirement which matches their raising capability, they can't do it at 100,000 pounds a month. You, you know what I mean? And those big lumps of five million, four million into inventory are not going to happen. So what could happen? What could happen is, if Sput believed the hundred and fifty, I'm I'm just quoting what they're saying, and 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 two hundred, they think if they can get a contract from a producer at eighty dollars a pound, they've got a forty dollar coupon in there, and so. So a possibility is completely hypothetical as the data centres are taking new electricity requirement not planned for four, four months ago, the spots of the world could be taking supply product 
that was meant to go to the utility for burning and Spud is taking it away for storing. So these are possibilities that all complicate uh, this world com coming out of a, an incredibly bad period to, you know, one where uh, there, are, there are a lot of people looking at a small and a smaller pot of yellow cake that is necessary to feed the conversion and the, you know, and all of that um, uh, uh, enrichment and, and so forth. So, it, and, and, and take on top of that, uh, if you're looking at another 400 reactors, you, better, you, need, you need, you know, what is it, 2 million, two, you know, 400 gigawatt of, 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 uh, of, of reactors, you, you need 2 million pounds each for each of those for initial core, which is just preparing the fleet for future growth. So more, more, everybody looks at, oh, yeah, I've got that many operating reactors. This is my supply I need. Well, growth is necessary of your fleet. So strategic stockpiles will disappear. That's why China is so aggressive. It's aggressive because it wants to build 150 reactors, which is 300 million pounds they've got to have to, to get those initial cores going. And, and they're still aggressive getting uranium because in 2040, 2040, 2050, they, they're building another, another 100 reactors which they need and, and they're, they're taking uranium that they need in 2035 today. And you can't go on bloody McKenzie uh, 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 business models of oh, what you need tomorrow by today, which is how the West world works. You know, it doesn't sort of think, and that's why it's been beaten hands down by, by the Chinese in terms of the rare earths, lithium, nickel, you name it, because they think in different time dimensions in terms totally. of... Totally. And the Chinese always think 15, 20, 12, uh, 20 years ahead. Yes. The, the, the West is completely different. I agree on that, definitely. Why uh, I'm saying that makes a difference is that that philosophy of how you accumulate strategic competes against the short-term utilities that are looking just for the next three years, five years, you know, all of this sort of uh, issue. They are complete at disadvantage uh, in this in this system. Yeah, agreed, right. Uh, you mentioned the data centers and AI. It is a hot topic when it comes to nuclear. Do you think we could see tech companies or oil companies invest in the uranium mines directly? You know, uh, in the oil shock days, um, uh, everybody was uh, so 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 struck by you know this 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 oil shock. Everybody came into nuclear. Everybody came into uranium. And when these all these oil companies came into uranium, they really didn't think what what how much how little money uh, it would generate. To generate such a huge amount of electricity of power, so they ended up thinking that, that, that they were making billions, you know. And all of a sudden, if you got a uranium mine or you're supplying uranium, uh, it, it is just two hundred million a year. So the the rewards weren't weren't matching to what they were used to, unless these companies could invest in the whole fuel cycle. Where when you look at it at that end, the the total the total value is a completely different thing. So I don't think the 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 oil companies will come into the into the into the system. I think the oil companies, if if they're looking for what their future is beyond beyond the hydrocar liquid hydrocarbons, um, I think that if there's nothing there, they 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 could. But look, I, I just don't think the the business case is big enough for them to be satisfying their shareholders when they're dealing on such a large scale of revenue that generates from their, from their oil businesses. But there are others that will need to invest. And I think that eventually, like in the 70s, utilities will invest in projects and to try and get to secure from, from sort of cornerstone project. I think that's 
that's a that's something that will happen after there is a lot of pain and uh, and 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 realizing that bloody hell, it's it's survival of the fittest. We've got to get our position, and and those sort of arrangements will uh, uh, maybe could happen. I think there's been too much expectation. You see, most of the utilities of the world are government. These slow, cumbersome machines that look around, and it's and there's a there's a comfort of a of a government utility talking to a government uh, supplier, and they talk all these bloody languages, and there's there's some faint yeah oh so, you know, there's secure but in, it's false. There's no security of supply. And when they realise that, that they need to start talking to new people, designing different arrangements of uh, supply than what was before to be able to compete for that pound, that's when they, they, they be, how they become innovative, that's their business. But it's not going to be the same old style as it was before. And, and, and I really believe that. Uh, and there, there's going to be, you know, there will be changes. What you can't have this catastrophe. Yeah, yeah. What about tech companies, the Oracle, the Google, the Microsofts? Will they enter the uranium production cycle by investing directly in mines? Well, let's pull back a little bit. Uh, I've, I've been on on the uh, working groups with with, uh, with, uh, with WNA, and, uh, and and I've always said that. I only wish there was an Elon Musk's in this in this in this in this bloody industry that sees the future, that has the balls, and to to commit to go ahead. And there was none. They're all sitting there, spreadsheet boys. You know what I mean? And and they were looking on what the spreadsheet, even though uh, 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 this word uh, energy transition, which is the most misunderstood word that you could ever believe simplified and 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 we get you know renewables which only work for a quarter of a day somehow they're going to supply for 100% of the day and 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 and, and all of that so i think in in terms of um, the where where this this uh, where we're going to is it, I forgot my thread of my of your question. Um, the can you just repeat your I, question? I ask you if the tech companies will enter the oh. uh, so Google's, uh, Microsoft's, Oracle's so, yeah. will they invest directly in the right. uranium mining? So, so what's happened is the, the the Googles have introduced a new type of character into the into the business. They've introduced a person who has a vision, who has belief, and who has commitment to grow their company and expect by that sort of uh, 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 vision a different to say, look, I'm doing this and I want power. And the utility says, oh, I can't. What do you mean you can't give me power? What do you mean by this word? That it's not some bloody government bureaucrat talking. So the pressure on, on, on these utilities is huge. And at the moment, the utilities, uh, the, the, the hyperscale are saying, look, we're not going to build reactors, although Oracle has now said it's, it's funding an area where it wants three, three reactors. So all, all of a sudden you start to see invest in the, um, in, in the, in the, in the business. And what of the thing is that, Investing in the business is like, in a complicated business, is like buying an aeroplane. If you haven't got pilots, if you haven't got bloody uh, whole maintenance people, you can't you can't drive these things. So, building the reactors is not is not the end all unless you have an operator who can actually uh, do things. So. In a way, the utilities have got a, a prime seat that they could take advantage, but some relationship between the oracles and the utilities 
forget that they're utilities. What they've got is operating expertise. And they know how to operate safely. And um, but where where through the impatience, the hyperscalers will start looking and saying, "I'm going to capture a project." At uh, I'm going to start looking at um, you know, can I get involved in the in the nuclear fuel cycle instead of being a slave to this? And uh, because there's huge amounts of money involved in the in in the whole business. The hyperscalers are the end of product, but before that, some of the SMR vendors are also acting in a different way than the old-fashioned utilities, you know, were. were. You've got even Rolls-Royce now looking for product. They're more aggressive. Tony, you know, uh, the, the, the Microsoft guy. All of these people, there's a different character in, in, in the system. So will they buy into, into – there's definitely going to be change. There has to be. How that change will, will actually be best suited for whoever is involved there are many, many ways that they can do and innovate. But I think what we've got to do is accept that there will be change and it won't be the traditional, you know, utility as we know it today. They buy some product, they put the electricity into the grid and, 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 and. There'll be different relationships that will, that will uh, uh, come. Through. And especially uh, with the US where they're more going on the SMR program. And where uh, Dowie already confirmed that they they got to get you know, three times uh, the the need, and there's just no option. And the option is today's relationships in supply and demand, and how that is serviced is becoming out of date to what is needed in the future. So change, how that change will be, I, I'm I'm not I'm not quite certain, but there will be. Uh, different approaches uh, uh, by good answer John uh, let's move to Namibia and company developments what are you currently doing at Tumas so Tumas is as you know uh, in a in a in a sort of a, a detailed engineering phase and uh, and we we we've established uh, uh, an engineer we've got our owners team uh, that we're, we're, we're sort of building, which I think is really important um, as there's sort of less expertise in the engineering side. We're not saying we're engineering, but we're managing and measuring sort of uh, uh, progress. So uh, we, we are still uh, hoping uh, to get to be in a position uh, to make a decision on, uh, on FIT at the end of this year. And, and, the, um, and then we... We are looking at the uh, the project financing, which is moving well, and and the uh, and and there is appetite uh, there for project financing, at 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 levels that we require. So whatever level it is, it, with the, the the sort of lower limit and the upper limit are completely within what we what we need, under certain different scenarios, um, and and I think that. Uh, if you know, we'll get a position on on debt. Uh, you know, a conditional uh, thing that if if it doesn't suit us, the uranium prices, we'll just make them conditional that we will achieve this price to activate that debt. If you get what I mean. But I'm not locking in a, a contract unless they fit with what we need or what the shareholder uh, deserves. Okay. Uh, let's say I'm a new investor doing a due diligence on your company. Can you walk me through the timeline, approximate timeline of production and development, as well as uh, this financing you mentioned? Can you give me some more color on that? I can't give any more color that's in our presentations. I'm saying that we will be delivering uranium product in the second half of 2026. We will have a construction period of 18 to 20 months. This is what we're planning. And, and, the, uh, and, the, um, and essentially, we will be spending our money uh, uh, that we have before the debt drawdown happens. Mm -hmm. 
So all that that raising that we made of two hundred and fifty million, even if I'm modesty aside, was a stroke of bloody brilliance, because it's given us a a a a, a possibility to do things differently. Uh, to proceed, we can do our early early work starting late this year, or you know, starting from very soon, and 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 developing, and then when when the drawdown needs to happen, I've got to say, oh, drawdown will happen in twenty in the second half of twenty twenty five. I'm not locking in bloody finance on a price that is December twenty four on where I think price will be when we need the drawdown. So we've got to work out somehow that, that we, we, are, we are not locked in. I don't mind being locked in, but at a price that's closer to production and where we're at. So those, uh, I've gone off track in a sense, but the, the, the getting into um, the execution of the project will start early next year. And that'll give us that sort of 18 months to, to, to develop the project to 20. And in that second half uh, is production and commissioning. So that's, that's the program. We've got all the approvals. There's no, there's no, uh, no um, uh, uh, issues. By the end of this year, uh, the, uh, before FID, what we will have is three very important uh, uh, components of execution, which is the scope of the project defined, the budget of that scope, and the schedule and milestones all frozen. So once you once you've got that, then you know we we will we will absolutely hold off on variations and and all of that, and that will determine you know finally you know the 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 period the quarter in which we hope to uh, achieve the, uh, uh, the the production side but we're we're waiting on yes feed with the uh, with the control cost estimates and all of that but more important is the frozen that that frozen um, sort of uh, template if you like of of how and when we'll achieve our, our objectives. Understood. Uh, what about Omahola and joint ventures there? What is their current status? Uh, Omahola, we're, we're just holding at the moment um, uh, because you know, it's ta and, and we'll come back to Omahola. We're still positive with Omahola that it's on a it's on a on a on a structural trend that is uh, extending from uh, uh, Husa, and and what we are uh, um, uh, pleased with. Is that uh, in the in the basement where Rossing and Husab exist? There are two levels of mineralization. One level which gives you that sort of one hundred ppm, and there's another level of of introduction of a secondary uranium which gives you the higher grade where you can get four fifty. Uh, 350, like Rossing, and where Bannermans is sitting at 200. Omahola has got those two phases, and Omahola is that we 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 are looking, even though we bought it into a cutoff of uh, of uh, 100, just to fit in with the with the uh, with the um, uh, with the termers, that. When you look at the old, you know, we had 120 million pounds at 450 ppm. That was because of that, of that high grade. If you go to those that haven't had that secondary enrichment, you, if you put the cutoff up, it disappears because it hasn't got that phase. So we're very encouraged that that, that will give us a different, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we get those discoveries, uh, we will have a, a, a deposit more similar to not necessarily in size, but in character to what Husab and Rossing were, are, and, uh, and that gives us uh, uh, encouragement to continue that exploration on that zone, on those zones. Okay, uh, Western Australia, before we cover the projects, uh, can you tell me more about the uh, sentiment, about what are you hearing and seeing about the potential policy change there? 
Well, of course, for us, that doesn't matter very much. For us, we have an approved project. So we have, uh, uh, and one of the reasons why we went to Mulga Rock is that, um, uh, and what Vimy did extraordinarily well, is that they they committed substantial works within the five-year period they had, as did Cameco on, on, on Yaliri and Kintai, and as did Toro on, uh, on Lake Way. And, and in that way, that, that, that environmental approval was given, so we saw that as, as de-risking the project and all we need to do, yes, there's other approvals, and, and ex but they're just more, you know, transport um, water. They're not, they're not fundamental. Uh, so, so for us, um, the, and, and we know with, with governments, none of them will stop the export of uranium. So that's, that's part. And why, why should they be? We're surrounded in Australia as a, as a, let's say West Australia is a huge, minerals uh, state, which is really a nation in, in mineral terms. And all around us, you know, India, uh, uh, Korea, and all of those are using nuclear as their emission uh, uh, emission target uh, uh, sort of uh, technology. Uh, Australia is using uh, renewables. Good luck. And uh, and and so and and the West Australia trades with these countries in all other commodities, and there's free trade agreements sort of happening. So they know that this this uranium, you you might have an ideological position in the Church of Wokeism that might think that 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 uh, um, uh, you know renewables are going to do the 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 objective. They should just talk to the Swedes. But anyway, that's that's another story. But they can't deny the product where other countries are believing the nuclear option is also essential for them to achieve their zero emission targets. So in that way, the export of uranium out of Australia, I think, is assured by both governments, you know, opposition now or the Labor that is, uh, uh, that is in government. In terms of changing that policy, um, I think that the policy probably won't change in the in the next uh, election if Labor get in. There are too many factions. There's too many this and that. But inevitably, it will change. As sure as night is day, and uh, and if the opposition get in, then they will uh, they will advance the the. The, the uranium mining, the nuclear option is a more, much more longer term. Uh, uh, thing. Okay, so we're, you. yeah, we're yeah. largely uh, um, uh, sort of uh, protected on that and we're not relying on policy to uh, for us to advance Mulga Rock. Actually, what are you doing at Mulga and Alligator River projects right now and what is the current status and what are some next steps? Well, basically, when we when we did the due diligence on Vimy, uh, we saw value that Vimy did not see absolutely in Mulga Rock, and uh, and that's why we did the merger. And that value was in four parts. One was the the we believe that uh, you could you needed to look at the uh, in the approved area of the Mulga Rock East, which is the Ambassador and Princess Deposits, that by looking at a, a in the footprint of the deposit, looking at it much more holistically of the uranium and the non-uranium, you could increase the value of that project hugely, substantially. And, and then we looked at we would need to var validate the leaching kinetic characteristics of the non-uranium and to say that that would be a, a hurdle. And also then to do, we did over 800 uh, holes uh, to get the, the deposit and characterise it, you know, it, it 
at the sort of in, um, indicated measured level, not only for uranium, but all the other commodities that were there, of which deep, uh, uh, Vimy already had a huge amount of data, but we needed 800 more holes just to get it uh, into. And that, that came out extremely well. Nearly 30% more, more uranium. Um, the other elements really came together and in terms of equivalent uranium, when you concluded it all together, a completely different project started to emerge. The, the, and, and then the fourth, third component we needed to do was to look at a mining approach that was not highly selective because all the other uh, people did was picking the eyes out of the deposit and, and resulting in a 15-year life, whereas on a more holistic approach, uh, uh, mining, so you capture most of the uh, uh, deposit where it's economic, that that you would uh, uh, it needed different mining, it needed different approach in terms of how your your ROM paid, how you blended, whether you had to blend or not, and um, and we've now just about got the new mining sort of approach uh, defined, and now we've announced as well uh, just for optimizing um, uh, a resin pilot. Uh, uh, study, which is only only sort of three months because we know the resins work and uh, to get the three streams of value out of the project. They are going very well. We've announced the the, the resource upgrade. We've announced the leaching kinetics and uh, and by sort of next quarter of next, uh, next year, we will have those ready as the components that will drive the revised, the revised DFS. You revised because there is a DFS at 2018, and will be and and it will, look, we think uh, you know it's going to be a six to eight nine month exercise to do, and by the end of next year we will have a a, a revised believable DFS, which will put Mulga Rock in a position of where Tumas was at the end of you know at the earlier this year. And it'll it's phase in beautifully with the, and on a production schedule there at this stage, that we 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 think that a twi- uh, late twenty eight we could be in production on that project, plus or minus three months for whatever. Um, so we're working diligently at that. We have uh, we have uh, people that are working at the moment where we're drilling the. Um, large bore uh, um, uh, 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 core to get uh, some tons of material that will be used in the in the um, in the resin leach tests uh, well the RIP you know and how how we how how efficiently that comes out and um, yes so look that's that's emerging and uh, and we've costed that in into our into our sort of overall planning and and of course the big the big sleeper for us is uh, uh, alligator project which which uh, Vimy also did exceptionally well to get that project uh, together. It couldn't afford it, but it got it. And and what we're looking for there is clearly not Anguara. What we're looking for is a cluster of deposits like Ranger 1, Ranger 2, Ranger 3, and Jabaluka is just next door. So we know these deposits manifest in, 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 in multiples and looking then, we believe, uh, um, you know, 150 million pounds of uranium, plus or minus 50 million, I think it's more in the upper uh, area, and that we would uh, define that uh, by the end of this decade and through isolating this large area that we have into specific prospective corridors that are based on the exploration model that we believe can control mineralization and using that as our nursery for discovering more prospective areas and coming in and drilling them out. We'll also, in parallel to that, already have targets that that have been uh, illuminated by the definition of the prospective corridors that we'll be drilling in detail in parallel. So that's that sort of program that will be uh, in, in Alligator.
That was actually my next question. Apart from the drone surveys you did and uh, LiDAR uh, data acquisition, are there prospects for corridor delineations and follow-up yes, drilling? Yes. Uh, so it could happen anytime soon. So we've got, we, we have ways, we have geology, uh, we have geophysical uh, uh, signatures of, of magnetic gravity and things and, and looking at where deposits are and from that, combination and and already some results that Cameco achieved we will start we have defined the prospective corridors and how they wrap around certain fundamental geological features so they they become the focus of our work and uh, and and a result there that is anomalous would be far more significant than an outlier somewhere where you get a, a, a where there's no thematic to it so yes, we're confident, and um, and we think. I mean, we've worked in there. My my team, myself, in the in the in the in the eighties, in the late seventies, and um, and we have a a different vision of how how this mineralisation is controlled in the Alligator Rivers region, differently to what it is in the Athabasca, in the in the below the uh, the Athabasca. The, the mineralizations are essentially similar and where the manifestation of a of a peculiar enrichment occurs in Athabasca which is these pencil rich uh, sort of 10 percent pitch blend uh, uh, don't occur in um, and and too many people have wasted too much bloody money trying to find that type of target in the Athabasca but the Athabasca has got less, pounds in it than what already has been discovered in, uh, in, in, in the alligator region with that exploration only carried out a day, decade and a half. And uh, so I'm very, very uh, 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 bullish about the potential of that region and, um, and, 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 it, and it could offer a, a potential uh, prospect for development in the early 30s. Uh, one other question about alligator. Do you have buy-in from the local First Nations? Uh, I mean, if you're in good standing with the locals, could you consider a tilt uh, at the not-so-far-away Jabaluka or Ranger 3 uh, deposit, uh, three Ranger deposits? Well, um, by our... The, our agreements, uh, which is something that, that, that I was part of initiating back in the, in the early 80s when uh, my, my, the company I first worked for was a German group, Called Euronets, and we we uh, developed the first uh, comprehensive conjunctive agreements that not only allowed exploration, but also a bridge with a full compensation package for mining, everything. So already the determinants of pays, royalties, all of those are built into that, so that we that we you know we wouldn't be. Uh, vulnerable to discovery and then a veto on on mining. So in in that in that area, uh, these agreements are you know once we've made a discovery, once we have the 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 ore body, once we have uh, feasibility, moving to the next stage is much easier under this regime because already there's approval with the traditional owners, unlike in any other region, and. Um, the, the biggest uh, catastrophe that's happened is the local, the government, the federal government, where, you know, energy is going to be the absolute driver of everything for the next 200 years until other technologies come in, where they've sterilised now a 325 million pound deposit in Jabaluka. And, and, uh, and that's based on ideological bullshit, and 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 that's based on you know a, a traditional owner that exists in this generation, where we've got traditional owners in our 20, 40 kilometres away that are pro nuclear. So why not leave that as an asset for the future um, uh, indigenous people to decide uh, whether to exploit it or not, and and not leave it to, you know, paternalistic attitudes. 
and 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 not engaging and saying, no, no, we're going to sterilise it and put it back into the park, almost sacrilegious. There are people now, uh, you know, debating, you know, to say to recover that position, but um, uh, that's 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 an unfortunate thing that's evolved in the alligator region. Okay. Uh... Final part of the interview, I have some questions from my followers. Please try to answer them in a one-minute answer, okay? <laughs> yes. Okay, let's start with the first. Uh, does the conversion bottleneck keep utilities from signing new contracts? The Look, I'm, they're all sort of dependent on the... the the conversion bottleneck is probably the biggest uh, uh, impediment around in terms of that it's only through three three area three sort of regions of the French, the US, and the Canadians, and um, and there is a genuine need for that to to improve. Yeah, it is it is concerning. Um, I think the capacity of building those factories aren't as uh, prohibitive of doing enrichment. So, I'm, and I'm saying that maybe other other utilities, other other nations may build may build conversion facilities because basically it's a chemical factory. You know, you're converting U three O eight into UF six, uh, really conditioning for the for the. Yes, yeah, so it is. It is a. a, a, a a worry, as is the whole fuel cycle, but that whole fuel cycle is interdependent, all the products in it. Uh, second question, why do contracts have NDA? Uh, if the miners are in the driver's seat, can they just say, no, we are going to disclose that part? It's a, it's a historic... Uh, uh, Sort of happening, if you like, because um, uh, the new the 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 uh, civilian uh, uh, nuclear developed uh, in the late seventies and basically came out of the in terms of the expertise that crossed over and the secrecy at which the nuclear armament programs were running on. That some of that secrecy transferred into contracting so the and and this uh, uh, this non-transparent market uh, which 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 I don't know how sustainable it is because I notice quite a few companies now especially the juniors they don't they don't sort of adhere to these uh, these sort of secrecies and things come out and trade trade tech uh, but it's remarkable how all the utilities have adopted this this uh, this, uh, this this process, and and the um, I wish it was much more open. I don't think we'll ever have an LME type type program because it's different. You know those relationships are between suppliers and uh, and and utilities and the fuel cycle and all of these sort of things uh, uh, really command a different approach, but. I think it'll be with us for a while, uh, but already we know. I mean, we what, what transparently we know that there's a floor and a ceiling. Those market relates happen. We know that public companies have to announce in their financials. Now, when public company has one mine, the financials have to record what you're getting. Whereas with the government ones like Arano or with with Rio. Those financials were locked in within the whole consolidated, and they're hidden. You can't even say. So there's a lot of pressures as the as the as the uh, 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 single company, publicly listed company, that it comes out through that through that back door. As does when you can look at the costing of the Kazakhstan, and that nonsense that they say that it costs them twelve dollars to sixteen dollars. Well, it's not 16. That's just the solution part of it. When you look at the mining equivalent cost, which is the well field cost, add another 15 to $30 on that cost. And that's, that's then the total cost. And in the, in the figures of, of, of the Kazatoprom, those depreciation figures are really mining costs uh, or, or the, you know, drilling out the, uh, uh, the well fields. Next question. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, why not consolidate all of Namibia, well, Namibia's projects into one supplier with a joint venture B with BHP or Rio Tinto? Well, I, I don't. I, I think that um, if if that person is meaning all of the non-Chinese uranium. Well, uh, because the Chinese won't consolidate. I mean, you've got the two of the largest the utilities in China now represented through CNNC in Rossing and through uh, 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 CGN in, uh, in Husab. Um, the, the consolidation uh, in, um, uh, in Namibia is, is always a possibility um, when you realise how many pounds of low-grade material there are in the in the Namibian uranium province there is substantial and there is room for things to happen uh, like that uh, next question are you open for for more MA yes yes and uh, and opportunistically um, uh, I still think the industry, is broken, it's not there ready, uh, uh, and there's not enough companies of a size that will that will uh, uh, be in balance with the new demand that may be 250 to 320 million pounds by the early 40s per annum from the mining, I'm talking mining uranium, and mining uh, at, to the 150 that is today. So, so in that sense, the companies have to be muscled up and not little itty bitties. Uh, I see uh, um, uh, Paladin is trying to do that with the with the with the sort of uh, fission uh, combination. Next Gen doesn't necessarily have to do that because it's got a, a large project. But I think consolidation has to be part of the uh, what I call the post Fukushima reconstruction of the supply sector. Uh John, what do you think of proven resources in the ground in Namibia deposits? How much are they worth? Let's say the Chinese or the oil company wants to make a bid. Is $10 per pound reasonable at $80 spot or not? Back in the in the um, in the period of the sort of uh, uh, when Paladin was uh, was was going, the EV per pound moved from three dollars, two dollars, to eleven dollars to ten dollars, where where the Russians bought uh, the Tanzanian deposit, uh, where uh, where the French bought Trent Copy, so they were in that sort of ten eleven dollars a pound. With a with a sort of an expectation that the price of uranium at that time was going to be in that seventy to eighty dollars a pound. If you're looking at uranium price, let's say arbitrarily being at the ceiling of the market related of one hundred and thirty dollars a pound, I see that if that is a realizable price that people look at, that an EV per pound, and then, yes, grade counts a little bit, so, you know, you might discount that a bit. So replicating that sort of 8 to $12 a pound is not an impossible uh, uh, consideration. Totally. Uh, the next question, will the project development financing uh, limit your M&A activities? Look, there are many ways of doing things, and 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 uh, naturally, I'm not going to go into how. Well, I've got a team. I've got a reputation. We've got demonstrated capabilities. We look at opportunities a bit different than how maybe others look at it. Not only from uh, uh, the, the eye of a dreamer, but also through the eye of an engineer, of the process people, of the geological, all of those sort of things. So, the and as as utilities and financial groups that are that are going to show their hand to where the uh, where where uranium is going to be, 
Then there are different ways of participating in that future where you know, uh, uh, arrangements can be made where uh, that's to fund that and not to fund Tumas and Mulga Rock, which are part of the deal, but to, to develop a company that goes from £7 million to, to 15 to £20 million. That, that is how we can sort of start looking at funding because we have value, we have ability. You can have as much money as you like. You put it into some of these companies. They'll never turn it into to say, hell, this is what this is where this this group can get to in terms of new projects. So we, we think there are ways of, 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 of dealing with that um, uh, uh, um, in parallel with what we're doing at the moment. Okay. Hypothetically. Three. Yeah, uh, three more, and then I will let you go. Uh, what is John's favorite conventional mine globally, either operational development or exploration? Long life, less difficult projects. For me, a ranger type operation that was operating at about 0.35 million. 0.35% uranium, big resources, have that project in a dry climate, not in a monsoonal climate with huge rains, or in a Canadian environment, which is really a sub subaqueous uh, environment. Um, I would I would I would say the the uh, the ranger type for me. Uh, is is a is a very good uh, uh, sort of uh, deposit to, and and if it had not the politics, there's still one or two all bodies still in there that you, you know it, it could have been uh, exploited. Uh, how is your share structure looking now? How many shares is held by the big boys? Uh, you had a recent filing last month about Vanguard increasing position. Who else is on the board, the ones that you can disclose? That's the question. Look, there, uh, since we've gone into the ASX 200, uh, there's been a huge amount of index funds that have come into the, into the, into the, into the company. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it called? State Street is another one. Uh, Vanguard, which has come substantially, and 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 many others sort of been dragged in. Um, in a way, that index funding creates for us a bit of an issue, which I don't worry about. Is then they sell that, and they, the shorters come in a little bit with their with their dream times. But but um, the uh, I think as long as we 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 create value, they're the main ones. Paradise. There's a few under the with, with real sort of investors that are there on the thematic. Um, so one of the good things that has happened for us is that from a uh, pre the 250 million um, uh, raising, we had basically some institutions, about seven, and and the and basically uh, sort of uh, uh, wealth wealth. Uh, sort of investors or mums and dads. Now we've got about 40 uh, 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 institutions. Um, the, the, the index funds are coming in. So we've got a much more mature sort of, uh, uh, which, is, which is preparing us for our journey going forward. Okay, uh, final question. Actually, those are two questions. What is your cash position and do you plan to uplist maybe on, on Canadian stock exchange or American stock exchange in the future? Our last declared position of cash is $257 million plus some, uh, some receivables that add up to about another $8 million. Um, the the um, the Australian Stock Exchange now is a very modern platform that is very transactable. It's digital, and uh, and and the and the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange still has to get to that that level. Uh, in Paladin, I had the most successful dual listing of any any uh, listed company, where where the you know by but more by accident that the 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 cross feeding of both those exchanges were just 
terrific in high volume. Um, I've lost a bit of faith in the uh, tr in the Toronto Stock Exchange. I think that there are more Canadian people coming into the trying to getting into the ASX, and uh, and and through that there's a very good connection into the European because of the way in which uh, uh, the stock exchange and it's not working on 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 1950s practices, very transparent. Uh, uh, shareholding, not through brokers, no bows, hobos, dobos, and all of those sort of arrangements that exist. So, unless now the 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 US is a different story, you know. I mean, we're on the sort of uh, OTC, but it's not, you know, it's 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 it is what it is. And um, if 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 we sort of get uh, you know sort of uh, larger and uh, and we need, we have the resources to to service those. Uh, yes, we might think it, but not in the moment. We're, we're, okay, yeah. uh, Mr. John Borshaw, thank you very much for coming to my show. It, it it was a brilliant chat, and I really really enjoyed it. And I hope uh, it will not go. We will catch up soon, not one Just year to talk, pass. Huh? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> In a few months, we have to talk again, uh, and you will keep us update, uh, updated on the developments uh, for your company. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for persisting and getting me on the show. I also enjoyed it.